for that kind introduction. It's always, um, can, can everyone hear me? I guess this is my first thing I should say. Yes. 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 Okay. So the, these technology arrangements are always um, interesting, and, and uh, the unique thing about this is I'm looking at the back of all your heads. <laughs> I just wanted to forewarn you of that. Um, and also, uh, in full disclosure, uh, since it's summer, this is the first presentation I've ever given with a proper shirt on and my flip-flops on. So it's, it's nice to be able to be casual. It's, um, it's, it's probably as hot up here today as it is down there. Um, I, uh, I always start these conversations with um, a little bit of, of, um, of my personal journey. And the first thing I'd like to say is that um, I did leave J.P. Morgan in 2001. Um, so please don't hold me accountable for any of the things that have happened at the firm since then. Uh, I, I, I do believe that uh, the firm I worked at, which was prior to the merger with Chase, uh, represented uh, the kind of values and culture that we, we all really um, uh, uh, wish we could still find on Wall Street. And um, so my, my leaving had nothing to do with all that, but, um, um, but, but observe, as an observer to what's happened to Wall Street, it's, it's, it's been difficult for me to, to watch, as I'm sure many of you. Um, since then, I've, I've gotten extremely passionate about this whole sustainability challenge. And, um, and in 2010, uh, we started uh, a nonprofit called Capital Institute uh, with a very um, uh, kind of organic uh, approach. We had no big grand business plan, but I just knew, having uh, studied the systemic issues quite deeply for uh, several years prior to 2010, and really in a kind of personal search for how is it that you know modern economics and finance, which I knew so well, could be, could be seemingly so much at the heart of the both ecological and, and social crises that I was, I was um, beginning to understand, uh, that I just felt a, a fresh place to really wrestle with the, the deeply profound questions was needed. Uh, I didn't find uh, the existing academic institutions uh, were really delving deeply enough, and, and so this is why I'm very grateful to be here with you. Um, I, I do think, in particular, our business schools uh, are, um, frankly, behind the curve on, on grasping the enormity of the change that's upon us and, um, and, and in recognizing how profoundly we need to rethink a lot of what we've assumed and accepted as normal for, for, many, for a long period of time. Wow, you know, you guys just moved on me. <laughs> that was very tricky. I, I was sort of noticing and not noticing at the same time. So anyway, this feels much better. So I started Kevin Student in 2010. We're a small nonprofit and, um, and really focusing on um, uh, what I would call the deeply systemic issues that, that are facing us. And, um, and for our talk today, what I thought I would do is really talk about four things. Uh, and probably leave you with as many questions as answers um, uh, for you to wrestle with. So that may, that may leave at least some of you um, discontent, but, um, but know that that was the plan at the beginning. Uh, the first thing we'll talk about is the leadership challenge, and by this I mean the business leadership challenge. And this is really the opportunity for you all, and, and frankly for all business schools. Um, I, I don't think there could be anything more important than to uh, reimagine business leadership to deal with the issues that we're facing in the future. So we'll talk about the context uh, very briefly, and then I'll lay out um, the overarching framework that we've developed over the last five years, which we're calling regenerative capitalism, and then save plenty of room to sort of dive into some of the issues in finance and where I think the regenerative framework uh, is going to lead us when we, when we dig into finance. A little uh, Marco Rubio moment there. Uh, <laughs> you know, jokes are always a little tricky on a, on a, um, over, over the wire, so to speak. So I'm glad you got that. Um, the, fir the first point to make, and this is really the overarching context setting uh, message, is that in uh, 2002, a couple of chemists, one a Nobel Prize winning chemist, 
claimed or, or, or announced that we had entered a new ecological era, the Anthropocene. And this made front page of The Economist in 2011, and, and The Economist basically wrote a story about how exciting this was and, and, and how terrific this was, uh, with some reference to the new responsibilities we have as human beings. But the point of The Anthropocene is that for the first time in the history of civilization, and in the first time in the history of the planet, uh, human beings will determine the outcome of the physical um, health of the planet. And that, is, um, that should be very frightening to us, and we should be humbled by that. Um, but the reality is that you know, that's not in the news, and, and, and uh, Trump is in the news, and we're not talking about what I would call the very serious issues that are, um, that are in front of us. And it's, it's profoundly new and different. There's no historical precedence for what we're, what we're grappling with. So on to the leadership challenge. Um, so here's business leadership. And I don't mean to pick on Jack Welch, but um, uh, I was at the firm J.P. Morgan during the two decades when we on Wall Street embraced this concept of shareholder value uh, and had it drive pretty much all of our uh, corporate advisory work. And, um, and even within the firm Morgan itself, we were driven by uh, a concept, uh, a shareholder value concept. We had a um, we had a, a slightly more sophisticated version of it that dealt with cost of capital, but um, shareholder value became the the dominant um, narrative and and ideology, I would say, of finance, and that drove business for the 1980s and 1990s, and in very many in, in very uh, many ways still today. And, and uh, Jack Welch came out and critiqued it after the stock market crash in 2000, uh, whenever it was, 2008, 9. Um, but um, but the, the hold that shareholder value, optimizing shareholder value, uh, has on us still to this day and in every business school I've ever been to, other than a few of the new sustainable business programs like at BART, uh, it's still the dominant uh, idea, I would say, that's driving um, uh, corporate finance. If we go back a little earlier, um, uh, W. Average Deming had a very different idea. And um, I had the opportunity to speak at a Deming conference maybe two years ago now. So I, I, I brushed up on Deming. I hadn't really studied him before. And it's amazing what he understood and, 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 and how much he, was, he himself was very much a systems thinker. Uh, and so one thing I would strongly urge us to do is go back and dust off our Deming um, because we're going to find an awful lot of, um, of the wisdom that we really need at this time because he was one of the very early people who understood how to think in systems. Um, just to give you an idea of what's happening in the private sector, uh, Paul Pullman, who is you know, undoubtedly the poster child of big business sustainability leaders, along with a few of his colleagues, recognized the deficiency of leadership uh, and the ability to, to grow leaders, uh, new business leaders. And, uh, and so he and, and, and a group of companies that are listed on the bottom um, set up a, an initiative called the Leadership Vanguard, and their tagline is Reinventing Growth by Reinventing Leadership. Uh, I'm not quite sure I, um, I love the Reinventing Growth bit, but um, I think I know what they mean. Uh, and I've just recently been asked to, uh, to work with them on finance. And, and as I studied what they're doing, they have this formula that's listed below the Vanguard Leadership Equation. And, um, and it's remarkably consistent uh, and would, would flow very nicely uh, within the regenerative framework. So uh, what I would say is that the, um, and, and this is, you know, I obviously know nothing about what you all are teaching uh, at your school. But I think this is a case where um, uh, academia and the academy in general is, um, uh, is in need of kind of accelerated thinking because there's a massive opportunity to, um, to train new leaders in a different way and also to retrain mid-level re leaders and even senior leaders in a new way. This is such a big shift that it's a, a massive opportunity for, for business schools. So let me shift now briefly to, and, and just talk about the context uh, I'm sure you all know most of this. This is kind of the, 
Debbie Downer part of the talk, but I just <laughs> briefly want to want to review it because it does provide the critical context for what we're talking about. Um, the, um, uh, the, the gentleman progress indicator no longer is published, but I can assure you that that line would continue going up, um, or the, sorry, the blue line would continue going flat, if not going down, if, if it were continued. And this is essentially a, a, you know, an estimate of whether, of, of genuine progress as opposed to GDP growth. And you can see that uh, they diverged way back in, call it 1970. And so we're running an economic system that's predicated on the simple idea that economic growth will drive prosperity, and it doesn't work. And it didn't create um, unpalatable problems for a couple decades, several decades, but um, we need to remember that the, the basic premise of neoliberal economics is that prosperity comes through economic growth, and yet the data would suggest that it doesn't work. And, um, and while economists have critiqued anyone questioning economic growth, they've never come up and proved that it actually works or refuted the, uh, the results of the um, genuine progress indicator, or there are several other ones like that. So we, we need to start with the very basic premise and, and the one that I've grudgingly come to after years of thinking about this, which is that our basic neoliberal economic paradigm uh, while it serves many positive purposes and has many values as a fundamental uh, theoretical framework for economic systems is, um, uh, in my opinion, to be candid, is fatally flawed. And, um, and, and not only because it doesn't work, but because it's leading us to catastrophic consequences, particularly with respect to the ecology. We also have, as everyone knows, social crises kind of unraveling around the world, um, and, uh, and then the one that is really most alarming to me um, because of the permanent nature of it is this concept of, of ecological overshoot. Um, the, the people at Footprint Network who coined the term um, ecological footprint have calculated that we are currently using up one and a half times the Earth's natural capacity to regenerate natural capital. So think of it as we're cutting down trees, we're cutting down 15 trees a year while we're only growing 10. And, and obviously, if you think about a savings account, if your savings account is earning 5% a year and you're spending, you know, if you have $100 and you're earning 5% a year but you're spending $8, uh, that doesn't go on very long. Although the first year you do it, you barely notice that it's a problem. And metaphorically, that's what's happening with our stock of natural capital uh, and and uh, it's, it's, it's complex and, and, and complicated, but the science on this is, is highly aligned. Um, uh, carbon, our, our global warming is one of the symptoms, but it's only one. If you want to really get depressed, go to a biodiversity conference and, and look at uh, the data on how rapidly we're, species are going extinct. So we have these, you know, I simplify this into three crises that are clearly interconnected. Uh, they could be uh, discussed each of them over days uh, in terms of their complexities and, and, the, um, and, and the intricate interrelationship between them. Uh, increasingly, people understand that the energy crisis, the water crisis, and the food crisis are inextricably, inextricably linked. Um, but it's actually, you know, that's really just the simple first layer of it. I would argue all of them are, are, uh, are linked together and therefore it's extremely complex to grapple with and understand how to deal with it. So I mentioned earlier that um, uh, I think that our, our neoliberal economic paradigm is flawed. Um, you know, the, the way we're dealing with the sustainability crisis, if you think about in particular the ecological issues, is we've defined them as externalities and we're doing a huge amount of work to put prices on those externalities so they can be internalized into the system. And for a bunch of reasons, I think that's vitally important work to do, but ultimately a, um, a failing strategy. I, I don't think it's ever going to be possible to, in, in a dynamic world that has complexity that's beyond our ability to, to comprehend, uh, to put a real price on all of the externalities 
and then factor them into our neoliberal framework and understand how to allocate capital and, and price uh, products correctly. Having said that, probably the most important thing we can do using kind of a blunt instrument is to put a price on things like carbon so we begin to shift the system in the direction we know it needs to go. So, you know, on one hand, I'm all for um, the, the approach of thinking of these issues as externalities and figuring out how to begin to price them. But, you know, one simple example, what would you pay for your first glass of water today? You know, you're dead without that glass of water. So there is no way to price that. And, um, and economics is not good at distinguishing between putting a price on a, on a wrong or, or on, a, on a bad or a cost that can be rectified with money versus putting a price on a wrong that can't be fixed with money. And so um, uh, I think ultimately the externality approach is, is going to leave us uh, up short. Um, and so we're, we are in need of a new theoretical construct. And um, there's a great quote that Albert Einstein uh, gave, which I use all the time, which is, it is theory that decides what, we, what can be observed. And I think we're stuck in that problem right now. We, we have only the neoliberal economic um, paradigm, so we think in that framework. And so we can't see, our path, we can't see a pathway to all other solutions, and we try to put the problems we understand into the current framework. And if the theory is fundamentally flawed, um, ultimately, it's not going to lead to an answer any more than a map of Paris is going to help you if you're in New York City. So we've spent a lot of time working on theory, and, uh, and I'm not a theoretician, I'm not an academic. Um, I have quite enjoyed it. It's been a fascinating uh, challenge, intellectual challenge, and it's been a, you know, kind of a, an evolving, peeling back layers of onions. And, um, uh, and I'd encourage you, if you're interested in this, uh, to read the white paper I put out at Yale this, this spring called Regenerative Capitalism. And so what I'm going to do right now is just give you a real small taste of, of what that journey looked like and where it's led us to. And the first piece of it is to, um, is to again, step back before getting into any of the economics and see the big picture. And the big picture, as it's become clear to me, and of course this is just my opinion, is that we are, we are locked in a, what I would call, reductionist paradigm. Uh, ever since the Enlightenment, we've uh, learned to think in a reductionist fashion. And there's huge benefits that come from that. We break down what's highly complicated into understandable parts, and then manage the parts. Um, and that works to a, a certain degree. But when you, when, you know, now that we're in the Anthropocene and all of these crises, interconnected crises are engaging us all at the same time, uh, I, I think it's literally impossible to manage them one problem and one part at a time. And I'm not the only one saying this. And, and the obvious answer to that is to switch from a, reduction, a reductionist way of thinking, which of course, again, we've been trained to do for literally 500 years, and every academic institution on planet Earth is filled with people who have learned that system and become proficient at it and expert at it and Nobel Prize winners at it. Um, so this is radical, re it's essentially rethinking how we think. And you know, the models uh, or, or the language we use is, you know, turn some people off, it's holistic thinking, uh, it's network thinking, it's integral thinking. Uh, and, and you all know some of the leading lights in, in these areas. And in many ways, what I'm trying to do is take what's already happening in areas like medicine and apply it to, to economics and finance. Uh, in many ways, what's happened in the technology industry is integral thinking and network thinking manifesting in the real world without there being some overarching theory to explain it. So in many ways, what I think is needed here is a bit of backfilling um, uh, to, to enable, enable us to see what it is that, that's actually happening. There are big companies that are thinking and operating in a, in a more networked, holistic way, Google being an obvious example uh, of them and, and many others in the tech sector, but there's also companies like DNVGL, which is a, um, a Norwegian, um, what, what they do is essentially uh, a cert certify the safety of, of big equipment. They start in shipping, they do offshore drilling, so they're a certification company. And uh, they've held roundtables around sustainability for three years, and it, it's amazing to me how 
how much they think in a holistic way. Part of it is culture. Uh, the Scandinavian culture is more inclined toward this type of thinking. Part of it is that they're a privately owned company by a foundation, so they can think long term as opposed to in short term, which is one of the problems of our reductionist finance system. Um, but uh, you know, increasingly, there are many others. We, we have a project uh, that's on our website, which we call our Field Guide to Investing in a Regenerative Economy. And we've now documented over 30 different projects that we've identified that are operating in this regenerative way. So it's, it's an emergent phenomenon. It's just not in the news, and it's not in the mainstream business schools yet. And then the final example, of course, is, is finance, and you know, in, in contrast to social media, and we'll talk about finance in a minute, but I would argue that the root cause of many of the problems in finance um, is actually not ethics, greed, and bad behavior, as horrible as all that is. It's that we fundamentally have developed finance to be, in many ways, the ultimate reductive, reductive um, practice. And I'm as guilty of that as anyone. I spent you know, over a decade managing derivative businesses around the world for Morgan and managing risks using derivatives, which are great tools when properly used, is essentially breaking risks down into their component parts and managing them in various pieces. And that's great in, in, as long as you keep, keep a track of the whole. But um, you know, in many ways, the, the surprise of the 2008 uh, meltdown was that all of these disaggregated risks suddenly were linked together in ways that people had lost track of. So that's a, a great example of, of the danger of, of staying in a reductionist mode without reconnecting to understanding the whole. So that was a lot. I hope that made some sense. Um, but in the interest of time, let me just keep, keep moving forward. Um, and by the way, I'm using Einstein a lot here. Uh, one of the reasons is that um, the, the, the term holism was actually coined by a South African named Jan Smuts, controversial man. He was, he was a Boer War general and, and the prime minister. Um, but he also wrote an amazing book called Holism and Evolution. And if you're really into this, I highly recommend it. And um, he and Einstein became pen pals, and Einstein sent him a letter that said, uh, my idea of relativity and your idea of holism will determine the future course of civilization, or something to that effect. Um, so um, if it's good enough for Einstein, I figured I ought to pay attention to it. And the point on this slide, though, is just to say that um, we've become very good at managing uh, what's complicated, but we don't even begin to understand the difference and how hard it is to manage complexity. And just think about the difference between uh, the challenge that we have managing families and staffs and, and companies. Those are complex organizations. And, um, and we seem to be much better at, at designing and building cell phones, which is complicated, but nowhere near as complex as, um, as the interconnected systems that we're trying to wrestle with now. So what does regenerative mean? You know, I don't have a great definition, um, but I'd like to put forward um, uh, in, instead more of a, a concept to think about. Um, you know, we're all having this conversation today because our bodies are regenerating. Turns out that our cells regenerate the, the longest, they regenerate at different rates, but the longest is seven years. So every seven years, uh, you're, you are literally physically a different person. And uh, the reason you're alive today is that your cells are continuously regenerating. And, um, uh, and that's the, the, not only a metaphor, but literally the model that I think we need to shoot for as kind of our North Star for how an economy works. Our bodies are healthy because our immune system is continually fighting off bacteria and problems. Our body is not healthy because uh, you know, we get a disease and then we treat the disease. That just deals with the symptom. And so here's the difference between Western medicine and Eastern medicine. If, if you really want to be truly healthy, what you want to do is, is build your immune system and take care of your immune system so you never get sick, rather than wait for symptoms to happen and then treat them with, um, you know, with, with medical uh, attention that often has, has um, uh, consequences, negative consequences. And what I would say is that we are, you know, as a group, as an economy, we're over on the left. Uh, the result of um, mechanistic thinking, which again is not evil thinking, it's just you know, less, less uh, uh, informed than we need to be today. 
And, and these consequences of our reductionist thinking are starting to spring leaks in the boat. And so the first stage is to try to green the economy. And so we, we start measuring our carbon output, and we start measuring and recycling, and we start doing all this good stuff we need to do. But we're essentially starting over on the lower left and trying to work our way to the right. And, and we have this idea that we're going to try to get to being sustainable. But again, using the human health analogy, you don't get to be sustainable as a goal. You need to be way over on the right, upper right, and, and, and in optimal health. And then the outcome is that you're, you're sustainable. And the premise is that the human economy is a system. The human body is a system. There are systems everywhere. And what the scientists have done is studied how systems remain sustainable. And the principles that I've deduced into this regenerative framework come out of that, that science. And, and so essentially what I'm saying is that there are universal principles that scientists use to describe how you know, living systems work, like, like uh, a river system, um, uh, and, you know, any, um, uh, you know, any ecological system is a living system, but also non-living systems, like the internet. And, and it's amazing how there are common features of all these systems that have been uh, sustainable. They're learning systems, and I'll get into this in a minute. And so the, the, the basic premise of the regenerative framework is that why don't we look to the, the principles of systems that we know are healthy and sustainable and, and, and put those up against how our economy works and then think about evolving our economy to be in alignment with those systems and those patterns rather than spending our time just plugging the dikes and in, in, leaks in the dike, which is essentially what we're left by doing if we don't move out of the, the reductionist neoliberal paradigm. And again, I say that not to criticize that work. That's critical work. We need to do both at the same time. We need to improve at an operational level so we move from conventional to green towards sustainable. But at the same time, we need to innovate and redesign and, and understand the potential of the regenerative framework, which is way over on the right. <clears throat> so now I'm going to shift to a reductionist approach in order to try to explain this. And I don't have time today to go through each of these principles, but these are the eight principles that are in the paper. And again, I'd encourage you, if you're interested in this stuff, to, um, to dive into the paper. It's a bit long, um, and it's not super accessible, but it's, you know, it's not meant to be a uh, uh, Barnes & Noble bestseller. Um, but it goes through this in much more detail. And I've boiled it down to eight principles. Uh, tried to get it to seven, couldn't quite do it. But that doesn't mean that there are eight, and it doesn't mean that it wouldn't be better described with nine, ten, or eleven, or it doesn't mean that someone smarter than me will be able to reduce it to three or four or five. Um, so this is just one attempt to describe these. Um, and, and let me just briefly talk about them now. Um, the first one is in right relationship, and this operates at all scales. So, for example, there is a right relationship between the amount of carbon that we can emit in the atmosphere and how much the natural carbon sinks will absorb. And we're in violation of that first principle. But in right relationship can operate at a very micro level. So for example, if you think about finance and banking, one of the innovations was securitization and derivatives, which made it more efficient. But it broke the relationship between lender and borrower. And so we didn't have relationships between creditors and, and productive companies. And then when things went wrong, uh, you know, homeowners couldn't even find where their mortgage was held. So there's a, and this gets to the, the final one, seeks balance. There's a balance needed between efficiency and resiliency, and one way to hold that balance is to remain in relationship um, between, in, you know, in the commercial sector, which I think we've lost track of. The whole movement away from relationship banking and toward transactional banking is evidence that we are, in a sense, violating this principle. Um, use wealth holistically, this is the whole multiple capitals thing that I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, uh, we're at 30 minutes already, oh boy. I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to speed up. Um, uh, in fact, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave you dangling with this, you're gonna have to read the paper to understand what all these things are. Um, um, and I, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to skip ahead, I'm sorry, so, so this is all in the paper. The final point about it, though, is that all of these eight individual um, principles need to be thought of as one whole, 
And, and as an analogy, think about you know a, an impressionist painting. The parts are the paint strokes, but but the whole is the painting. And and so uh, we can't we can't turn this into a you know a laundry list of things to check off. We need to understand how they all work together as a whole. So finally, moving on to finance, which is um, uh, in a sense my expertise. Um, the first point I'd like to make is that you know this is sort of the way the world looks through the eyes of a financier. There's the planet, and on the planet are natural resources and people, which translates to labor. Um, we we draw those into economic activity, and finance sort of sits at the top and optimizes the game by uh, allocating capital and, and in a way that's the most efficient in terms of generating return on capital, which is another way of saying the shareholder value paradigm. That's another expression of it. And and uh, if you think about it. Um, it's kind of exactly inverted from what we actually need, which is a financial system that's actually in service of, a, of the real economy, not optimizing for its own gain, and a real economy that understands it's embedded in the biosphere of the planet and not separate from it. So another way of saying we, we have a fundamental rethink to do compared to this kind of the un, unexamined um, assumptions we operate on today. Um, I'm now going to talk about some of the problems, and I'm not going to go into the detail because of uh, time. Um, I, I trust you're all familiar with stranded assets, the stranded asset issue. Um, I did a piece on this years ago and, and estimated that it's a $20 trillion choice we have to make between burning the fossil fuels uh, and exceeding the two degree warming limit or taking a, a write-off and, and absorbing that $20 trillion economic value, in, you know, absorbing a loss on that, much of which is sitting in, this, in essentially in the state, um, uh, state budgets. Uh, most of the reserves are owned by nation states, not by private companies. And that's such a huge number, it's just um, you know, mind-boggling to com contemplate how we deal with that. So that's a, that's a consequence of our financial system not, not properly addressing the systemic issues that we're facing. Um, it goes beyond just stranded assets. Think about all of the other off-balance sheet uh, liabilities that exist. The cost of having to repair bridges and repair um, you know, storm damage and, and, and Katrina damage. If you, if you project forward what we're going to incur, there's a massive uh, liability there that we know is coming, but it's not on anyone's balance sheet. Much of it's not insured. Um, if, if, you know, this is concept Herman Daly put out of a steady state economy, if it's true that material throughput is going to become a constraint on economic growth, which I believe is already happening, um, then the price earnings ratio of every public company is probably higher than the realistic long term growth rate is. Uh, you take PEs down, you start to have stock markets looking like they do today. Um, what's the debt capacity? Obviously, growth rate of cash flows determines debt capacity. So if the growth rates are going to slow, that has implications for the debt capacity uh, of the economy, and same for unfunded pension liabilities. The questions go on, you know, what does compound interest on a finite planet really mean? Is that possible? Uh, compound interest is the heart of modern finance. What's the relationship between the stock of financial capital and the stock of natural capital? I mean, that to me, we could spend all day on that question alone, but financial capital is there to be invested to generate return on financial capital. And if in that process, that generates throughput that destroys natural capital, then there should be some relationship between the stock, the absolute amount of financial capital, relative to the stock of natural capital. But we've never had to think about that. Um, IRR, when there's no such thing as in externalities, what does that mean? What is the discount rate we use to, dis to discount the cost of destroying the planet in the future? And what if the firm is the wrong unit of analysis? One of the interesting things about the um, leadership, the Vanguard leadership thing I, I had up earlier that's in the private sector is that they're very focused on the reality that individual firms can't deal with these problems. You need to work collectively on them and in a cooperative way. And yet all of corporate finance is organized around individual firms. So do we need a corporate finance for ecosystems of firms? I don't know. What does modern portfolio have to do with the real investment decisions, not security speculation, but the real investment decisions that are the, the, the bridge to the, to the new economy in a world that's becoming increasingly uncertain? That has nothing to do with it. That's how we manage our money, though, is on modern portfolio theory. 
What if there are limits to investment itself? I wrote a paper on that question. It's probably one of the more radical things I've ever written, if you're into that kind of thing. Um, but I actually think there are, because of the planetary boundaries and because of the nature of you know, the slow change of technology, it suggests to me that there's an absolute amount of investment that we can absorb without you know, spilling over into ecological problems. And then the public company. Who really owns a public company? That's a question that we haven't really wrestled with, but if no one really owns public companies in terms of being accountable and, gov and true governance, how do we change public companies? Obviously, we're struggling to do that. That's part of the problem we're having. Um, I'm going to skip this just in, in the interest of time so we can have a discussion, but um, I, well, I, I'll just say real quickly, we, we do have one area that uh, falls in the solutions category that I encourage you all to take a look at. We have a white paper on our website called Evergreen Direct Investing, this EDI idea. And it's a, a fairly uh, profound rethink in how, what investment means, and it's moving back toward uh, an approach to investment which is much more along the lines of a Warren Buffett. It's cash flow investing and it's collaborating, partnering uh, institutional investors with enterprises so that we can actually make the long-term transitions we need outside the constraints of short-term public markets. So if you're interested in that, uh, it's on the homepage of our website under EDI. Um, so finally, in, and in conclusion, um, I, I believe strongly in this idea of a regenerative framework. It's a, it's a meme now, it's a popping up everywhere, um, uh, which is very gratifying, and it's not popping up because people have heard me talk, it's, it's independently popping up. Uh, the idea there is that we need to understand what universal principles exist in the, in the real world, both the physical and the living world, and, uh, and apply them and make them relevant to our economic framework. Uh, I believe strongly that finance needs to retreat from its position of, you know, on the top to a much more humble servant. That's a tricky one for sure, um, but it's beginning to happen. Uh, we need to redefine, and it began to happen, for example, with the um, Global Alliance for Banking on Values. It's a group of banks that understand all this. Uh, I think there's maybe 30 of them in the alliance now around the world, the biggest one being Tritos Bank, which is probably the model of the bank we really need in this world. Uh, we need to redefine wealth. That's not news to any of you, but, um, but that's a, you know, a lifetime's bit of work there to think about how we do that and how we value wealth and then how we use analytical and non, you know, subjective as well as objective uh, means to, to manage it. Um, I think we need to keep our eyes set on this notion that real investment, not stock speculation, but real investment is the bridge to the future economy. And big companies and big governments and, um, and, and the, the super fiduciaries like the pension industry are the ones that have the capacity to do this real investment, so we need to focus on them. And then finally, it's impossible to have responsibility for the outcome if we don't have ownership, and so we need to rethink the ownership of public companies and the governance that goes with that in a much more profound way than, than we've done so far. And with that, uh, i leave you with a little bit of philosophy, but um, I do think we're in sort of an economic Copernican moment. Um, and uh, when I read this uh, many years ago, it, it really resonated, so I won't read it to you, but I'll just leave it up there and, and uh, cut off my remarks there. Thank you very much for listening. I hope I didn't run over too, too far. Always the danger of having too many slides. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions for John? Uh, I think we have time for a quick question or two. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, John, for a tremendous uh, presentation. I'm in the finance department, and I am very drawn to your presentation. I'm asking for some guideposts about my humble retreat. <laughs> no, I mean that seriously because I think you acknowledged in a kind of a sidebar that it's going to be very difficult when you're talking about the masters of the universe making millions, hundreds of millions of dollars and who make unlimited contributions to the people that run the political system. We need a little help in figuring out how we're going to make this humble retreat. So I would ask you to maybe think about that for us. 
Yeah, well, I, well, first of all, I'm, I'm pleased that you didn't attack me, because usually there's someone in the audience in the finance department that wants to throw a spear in my head. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, I, 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 I think identifying the issues is, is, you know, if we don't identify the key issues, then we're wasting our time. Uh, and I think the challenge on us finance people is to come up with a plausible alternative. Because, you know, it's one thing to wave my hands around and say, this is all a mess, it doesn't work. But it's another thing to actually have a, a meaningful, productive alternative. And, and um, as, a, as a little plug, I'm working right now on the complement to regenerative capitalism, which is going to be called regenerative finance, no surprise. And I'm going to lay out my thinking on what a financial system should look like. But then you need to get to the, the human issues that you're talking about. And, um, you know, our, our love affair with, with money and with winners and all that stuff. Um, and, and, you know, believe me, I don't have any of that figured out. But um, my, my goal is to, um, is to get more people working on it. And, um, and, and I think, you know, there, there is, I, the only thing I would say is there is under the radar, um, bubbling up everywhere, uh, lots of people who get this and are working on it and are coming up with alternatives. And, uh, you know, one day we're all going to wake up and what, what happened on Wall Street in 2009 is going to seem like, how could that possibly happen? Um, but unfortunately, you know, we're still in a mode where the guy who caused more damage than anyone gives a $400 million donation to Harvard and becomes a hero. Um, so, you know, we're, we have a long ways to go, but we better get to work. All right, okay, let's thank, thank you. Uh, John uh, for his time today uh, via Skype.